Let's move to the other issue, which is a huge impact for sure, and that's the collapse of First Republic Bank, the possible collapse of other banks here in the United States, uh, and of course the ripple effects that will have. And we are very honored to be joined here on the show by Chris Caruso, who's the Operations Director at the Cairo Center for Religion, Rights, and Social Justice. Chris, thank you so much for being back with us. Thanks for having me. Well, the honor is all ours to have you. Um, you know, we're, when we initially asked you to come on, we were talking about First Republic. Now it seems like there's a couple other banks that are here on the chopping block. We already had SVB. I mean, are we in a banking crisis here? And, and what does that mean, if so? Absolutely. Uh, we're in a rolling banking crisis. Uh, three of the four largest bank failures in U.S. history happened in the past two months, right? Wow. And although Biden has assured us that the banking system is safe and sound, uh, there is already, uh, after uh, the restructuring of, of First Republic, of uh, being gobbled up into J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, now the largest bank mm. with over 11% of all deposits in the country are now at this wow. single bank, right? That In 2007, 2008, we were worried about banks being too big to fail. They're now bigger. And uh, we've seen uh, reflected in the stock prices of these other, uh, you know, mid-sized regional banks, uh, banks like uh, Western Alliance and uh, PacWest, uh, under extreme stress already. Uh, so we've not seen the end of this. Okay, so is I don't know if there's one answer to this, but what is causing this right now? <laughs> or what are the causes of this right now, I should say? Yeah, well, I, I think that, you know, if you want to know <laughs> why this crisis is happening, it's always a good idea to look at how they tried to resolve the last crisis, right? And so when we have the, the Great Recession that starts in 2007, you know, one of the, the, the biggest kind of policy response was that starting in 2009, they, we had this, uh, you know, easy money regime where the Federal Reserve Bank pushed its lending rate down close to zero, you know, the rate at which it lends money to other banks. Um, and what this does um, by having this, you know, cheap money, easy money regime go on for literally 13 years is, um, you know, who does this benefit? Well, this, this cheap money regime benefits asset holders, right? It, 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 what it does is it creates asset bubbles. In particular, it drives up the stock market, it drives up bonds, it drives up real estate. And for the richest 10% of the United States that own these assets in significant quantities, it's been a fantastically successful policy. For the bottom 90% of us, it's been an awful policy, right? And so, you know, we, when we uh, had the COVID crisis and began to have a bit of a recovery of this COVID crisis and wages started to tick up a little bit, um, you know, the response of, uh, of the Federal Reserve and, uh, you know, Jerome Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve, came out and said it directly, we must get wages down. Right? We must get wages down. And they, I think, are terrified about an incipient uh, renewal of the labor movement in the United States. We've seen some recent victories, uh, Amazon warehouse workers and others. Um, and they, you know, he came out and said directly, we are going to you know, raise interest rates, um, making it more expensive to borrow, slowing down economic growth because it's more expensive to borrow to expand a business, uh, to start a new business. And... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, nip in the bud uh, any kind of real independent motion of labor in the United States, and so as they've begun to raise rates, uh, what we've seen is that um, you know whole industries are dependent on this cheap money. That so many of the business models of Silicon Valley um, are dependent on this you know virtually unending flow of very cheap money. And when it stopped, uh, they went into crisis. As these interest rates mm -hmm. went up to try to control inflation, to try to drive down wages, um, they found that you know, there are dozens or hundreds of these zombie companies in Silicon Valley that only really can continue, you know, they're not making profit, but they can continue to roll over by you know, just being able to continue to borrow cheap. And in fact, you know, that was, it turns out, really many of these business models, right? If you think about, well, what was the business model of Uber? 
Well, we were told like that the secret sauce was they were, you know, they had some special algorithm. They're going to root cars faster than anyone else could. Well, in reality, the special sauce was they had access to just tons and tons and tons of cheap funds coming out of Wall Street. And what they did is they used those funds to, uh, you know, undercut their competitors, right? The idea was that they would drive the taxis out of business, the car, car services, the livery services. They would use this cheap money to drive all their competitors out of business by offering below market rate rides. And then once they succeeded by using this, you know, un, uh, unending amounts of money to bash their competitors, they would then jack up prices and, and reap super profits. Well, Uber never quite got there because they, they flamed out, but many of the, the companies on Silicon Valley that tried to copy Uber's business model, you know, it was just based on this very, very cheap access to money that is, is now gone. And so, you yeah. know, we've, we've seen, you know, over, a, what is it, 150,000 uh, layoffs in the tech sector just in 2023 alone. You know, one of the things that was interesting to me about you know the way this was resolved and J.P. Morgan buying First Republic was that uh, you know the the so-called losses would be shared between J.P. Morgan and uh, the federal government. I wonder what that share is going to look like. But you know, the other element of that, that sort of bailout element of it, did make me think of something else. I mean, you know, the fact that this seems to be the way these things are resolved, just increasing banking consolidation, seems to also sort of you know, directly increase the possibility that we'll face even more, you know, pressure for these huge bailouts because it's just creating more kind of too big to fail mentalities and that the increasing concentration of the banking sector, and I'm sure it has a lot of problems, but that's one thing that I feel like, you know, people are like, oh, JP Morgan, you know, they bought it, it's over, it's been resolved is the way it's being presented, but it seems like it's kind of setting us up for, you know, just more and more of these situations where, you know, the average working class person is asked to pony up our tax dollars for, you know, someone else's, you know, terrible gambling. That's right. You know, this is extend and pretend, you know, this is just kick the can down the road and, and, and hope for the best, right? That we know that Biden's very proud of saying, you know, quote unquote, this is not a bailout in the sense of uh, direct, you know, U.S. tax, dollar, tax dollars going to, to the banks. But, you know, it is a bailout. Uh, in fact, you know, all of these high net wealth depositors who had more than $250,000, that would be, you know, the amount that's insured by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, that are, they are getting bailed out 100%. The shareholders of the banks themselves are taking a hit. Um, and the FDIC itself is, is taking a hit in terms of these losses. Um, but these high income depositors are, are getting back 100% of their money. Now, you know, who are these folks? The average American household, you know, the median American household has $5,000 in the bank, right? So none of us were in danger of losing our assets, which are insured up to $250,000. But, um, you know, the, the, the combined force of the, you know, the U.S. Treasury, uh, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC says that this top 10% of asset holders should not lose any money in any circumstance. And they will, you know, deploy tens of billions of dollars to make sure that happens when they, you know, when they face losses. I mean, the, the FDIC, in terms of the, you know, the work, that, the losses they took and the work they did to kind of restructure these assets to be taken over uh, by J.P. Morgan and other banks, uh, if you look at these past three major uh, bank failures, it's $35 billion that the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation has put towards this restructuring. Wow. Right? This is not... Trump change. Now, uh, Biden and them are saying, well, you know, ultimately that money is going to be contributed by other banks. It's not coming directly from the, the taxpayer. So in that sense, it's not a direct bailout. But of course, what does it mean for an ordinary person? It means it's going to be harder to get a loan and it's going to be mm -hmm. more expensive to get a loan. Right. And so this is this is this, um, you know, these profound imbalances that are happening in our economy that you know, one of the things that all these three major bank failures had in common is that they served almost entirely high net worth individuals, right? That over 96% of the deposits at Silicon Valley Bank were over the $250,000 <laughs> limit. Um, over three quarters of the deposits at First Republic were over this $250,000 limit. And so, you know, that's, 
that's the priority uh, is making sure that those high high net wealth individuals don't uh, don't receive any losses uh, when they're in their their banking situation. And this, you know, I think strikes ordinary Americans as incredible. I, I, you know, this is at the time when the, you know, the pandemic, ben, you know, the benefits that were extended during the pandemic, things like the child tax credit, things like expanded access to Medicare are all having the rug out pulled out from under us. Uh, all of these benefits are ending. We, you know, we know that we raised over 3 million people out of poverty uh, with uh, child tax credit and other programs during the um, pandemic. We know how to solve these problems. We just simply don't have the political will to do so. And I think it says a lot about the political power of the banks, right? That they, mm -hmm. you know, when they, when they win, you know, when they make a risky bet and they win, they privatize the profits. And when they make a risky bet and they lose, they get to socialize the losses. They become all of our problems. That's because of their political power. And, and I think that's one of the biggest lessons coming out of this situation. Yeah, and of course, you know, the average American who is uh, consuming any mainstream corporate news is just getting this like very confusing explanation about mismanagement, which I'm sure plays a role. I'm sure like there's some mismanagement. Mm -hmm. I mean, mismanagement is just one way of saying uh, it's like a nice way of saying like rigging. I don't know, like r rigging it for, you know, like you just explained, like privatizing profits and then knowing that the U.S. government's going to bail you out if you lose um, but then the other thing that I've seen talked about is also like a lack of regulation. And that, that does yes. raise the question of where's the regulation here? Like, isn't, aren't these banks supposed to be overseen by regulators? Like, shouldn't there be signs that this is coming? It doesn't just happen out of nowhere, does it? Absolutely. And there were clear signs that this was coming. And, you know, in, in terms of Silicon Valley Bank in particular, uh, right, that the, um, the, the Federal Reserve actually, you know, reaffirmed how safe they thought Silicon Valley Bank was shortly before uh, its collapse and, you know, testified that it did not present a systemic risk when, you know, in fact it did. But the, you know, one of the, um, you know, there's a whole history of deregulation of banking we could point to here, you know, the most significant being the... Um, uh, Commodity Futures Modernization Act passed under uh, Bill Clinton, a uh, Democratic president in 2000, um, which really undid some of the key provisions of the Glass-Steagall reforms, which were put in place to try to, after the Great Depression, to try to prevent something like that from happening again. And so the, the deregulation of banking has very much been a bipartisan project. Um, you know, Larry Summers was the biggest cheerleader of it mm -hmm. at the time. But more recently and significantly to this situation, um, in 2018, uh, under Trump, uh, bipartisan deregulation of banking happened, which said, uh, which was very important for how it played out here, that when you're thinking about the reserves that a bank has to hold, um, what counts as, you know, a high quality liquid asset? And what this reform uh, changed or the, this deregulation in 2018 said that a, a 30 year uh, treasury bond uh, would now count as uh, a high quality and, and importantly liquid asset. Now, if you think about it, if I buy a 30 year treasury bond and say, you know, if I hold it for its full term and say in 30 years, it's worth a thousand dollars. So in 30 years, it'll be worth a thousand dollars. But, you know, if I'm in a bad situation and I have to sell it, you know, 10 years into that 30 years, I'm not going to be able to get the full thousand dollars. I'm going to have to accept less money for that. Right. But what these banks did in Silicon Valley Bank and uh, all of these banks that have went under did is they said, look, under this new system, we're, we're doing just fine because we've got all of these long term 30 year treasury bonds, which are guaranteed by the U.S. government. So what happened is when this, when rates started to go up, right, when the Federal Reserve started to jack up interest rates, that meant that new bonds, new bonds which were interest, which were uh, issued since the interest rates went up, had better returns than the old bonds you could get prior to that, right? And so that means that the bonds that they were, that these banks were holding, um, were worth less, right? Because why would anyone want to buy one of them from you when they could buy a new bond with a with a better return? Right. And so the, the change in the interest rates meant that the collateral that the banks were holding was worth less. And it was this game that when, when they said, what is this collateral worth? 
they they got to report it as if it was at its full maturity value, right? What their bonds would be worth if they waited the full 30 years to, to, to send them, not what they would call mark-to-market pricing. What are they worth today, right? What are they worth right now? And so this is what happened. When Silicon Valley banks started to experience a bank run, right? People are, are worried about the bank and they're starting to move their money out of the bank. Well, they said, okay, well, we need, you know, we, where are the funds coming to pay people back their money? We got to start selling these 30-year bonds. So then people saw them taking a huge loss on the, the collateral they were holding. They were selling these, you know, for much less than they stated to the federal government that they testified to the Federal Reserve they were worth. Um, and then when people saw that, they said, oh, wow, there really is a problem. And that just accelerated the bank run, right? And so that's a, a direct way in which, you know, recent deregulation, you know, greatly contributed uh, to this problem. Mm-hmm. No, it's, I mean, that's an extraordinarily important point. They were not minding the story. I mean, the other kind of subsidiary point about that is the ratings agencies, you know, which were rating yeah. SVB. And I, I remember when they downgraded Fitch, downgraded First Republic to junk, they had been like B plus like the day before. Yeah. And it was just all the same information was available. It's just now people are saying this isn't going to work. So, um, you know, shades of Arthur Anderson here. Well, Chris Caruso, as always, you got to write a book, man. I'm telling you, I, I know you've yeah. been thinking about it we need you we need you to enter the field aggressively but thank you so much for joining us as always here on the freedom side thanks for having me mm-hmm